welcome to our mental health and society lecture. So my name is uh, Xiang Fei Meng. I'm the director of the mental health and society division. So today we're going to have a talk on evaluating strength model of a case management for people with severe mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. This is actually the results from CRHR funded multi provinces study. And I will introduce one of our presenter, Dr. Eric Latimer. He is uh, one of our senior researchers at the Douglas Research Center and also a full professor at Department of Psychiatry, McGill University. And uh, Eric has uh, several you know, important research interests. One of his interests is to test evidence-based practice in Quebec and other Canadian settings and using uh, trying to emphasize economic trade-off associated with different practices and then applying those uh, practices and to support the local applications and to see the benefit from different practices. So now I will turn to Eric to introduce other uh, guest speakers. Okay, thank you very much, Shang Fei. Um, so um, I'll just briefly uh, introduce, uh, first of all, two of the co-investigators on this team. Uh, Tim Aubrey, as you can see here on the slide, the professor of psychology, senior researcher at the Center for Research and Educational, on Educational and Community Services at University of Ottawa, uh, someone who's done a lot of research on community mental health and uh, homelessness as well. Uh, Janet Durbin, an independent scientist at CAMH, uh, kind of been there a long time, done a lot of uh, significant work on mental health services research in Ontario, um, and associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at U of T, and Marianne Roebuck, who's a freshly minted uh, PhD, a student of Tim Aubrey's, uh, who, as you'll see, did very significant work analyzing data from this study. So I also want to mention a number of other co-investigators I won't take the time to read everybody's name because we have a lot to present and not that much time, but, uh, but there were several other co-investigators um, from different sites, uh, including Rob Whitley, who's, uh, of course, who's with us uh, at the Douglas, uh, some consultants from originally from the Kansas School of Social Welfare. Uh, Rick Gosha is now in California. Uh, and then several people here in uh, at the Douglas, uh, two people who've joined as to analyze some of the data, and of course, lots of program supervisors, managers, and more than 300 clients. So, um, so this has to do with services for people uh, with uh, mental health uh, issues living in a community. Uh, the ACT model is very well known as a type of intervention for that population, but it's really for people with the most uh, significant functioning difficulties, the most severe illnesses. Um, so there's a need for lower level, less intensive case management, often referred to as ICM in English, suivi, soutien intensive variable in French here in Quebec. Uh, so there's a lot of variation in how that's implemented. Uh, among specific models of case management, the strengths model of case management is the most promising. So what is it? I could spend probably 20 minutes saying what it is, but I'll just very briefly give you the highlights. It's on, on one hand, it's a philosophy of practice uh, that's based on six principles that are listed here. I won't take the time to read them all, uh, and it, but it's also a specific way of working that relies on two primary tools, the strengths assessment and the personal recovery plan. And it also involves a specific way of organizing a weekly team meeting and close supervision of up to seven case managers by their supervisor. I like to think of it in summary as it's about helping clients leverage their strengths to accomplish their own goals. So it's very compatible with a recovery orientation. 
but the, it's just as structured as the ACT model, but it has more clinical specificity and it's, uh, it's, it, it can be assessed by a fidelity scale. So when the evidence was written, we really had five studies that provided weak evidence uh, that this strengths model reduced hospitalizations, reduced symptoms, improves quality of life, improves functioning with no Canadian studies. Our objectives were to test hypotheses that higher model fidelity uh, is associated with increased quality of life and secondarily higher, higher hope, functioning and community participation and then also lower costs. And then thirdly, we wanted to evaluate facilitators barriers and strategies to overcome barriers to successful implementation. So the study took place in seven sites, one in Newfoundland, three in Quebec, Granby, Quebec City, that's Fesh, in the Saguenay region, three in Ontario, in Ottawa, Kingston, and Toronto. Uh, so four objectives, one and two, we assess fidelity at baseline in 6, 12, 18, 24, and 36 months later. We recruited new program clients and assessed them at baseline four and a half months, nine months, 13 and a half months, and 18 months. I'll say also that the assessment of fidelity was quite elaborate and costly. Uh, we there was a lot of training of mostly team uh, supervisors who went to other sites to evaluate the other sites. So it wasn't self-evaluation. And that involved like about one and a half days per site, at least one day per site of on-site uh, assessment. The fidelity scale has these categories. Uh, there was one of the categories we ended up dropping because it was assessed too differently between Ontario and Quebec. Um, so we had quite a number of measures uh, for quality of life. We had two, the standard layman quality of life, 20, interview, 20 item interview, and also something called the patient generated index, which was kind of a, an innovation to bring this into mental health. And we had assessments at these various time points. It was really only uh, resource use and income that we assessed every four and a half months. And then we also importantly assess relationships between case managers and clients. So results, so fidelity rose uh, pretty much at all the sites over time. At one of the sites, the implementation was abandoned. Uh, you see here, I'll just mention this one. This is the St. John site. They had already started implementing the model in a fairly rigorous way. Uh, and, and actually Quebec City and Granby, to some extent that started, but they were not as far along as St. John's initially. So we ended up having kind of a total of 311 participants. Uh, you can see how kind of, there was some, of course, attrition over the course of follow-ups. We got the most participants from Ottawa, uh, which had a, a really large program and somewhat fewer from Kingston and the Saguenay. There's a lot of data here. We're not gonna take the time to look at in detail, but I'll just say briefly that kind of age at the sites varied from you know, late 30s, early 40s. Uh, it, generally you have here a population of people with severe mental illness with some variation in severity across sites. Uh, more severity in general at the Ottawa site uh, where kind of the ACT teams were basically full up, couldn't take very many people. So, so you had some ACT level clients going into the, the, uh, the strength teams in Ottawa. The Grand B team is, I think, ended up getting somewhat less uh, ill clients. This is what the distribution of annualized total cost looks like. So you see some people with negative costs some people were working and really didn't cost the system that much. And a few people were quite expensive. So, um, so testing hypotheses concerning quality of life and other measures. Um, well, we predicted nine and 18 month values of the layman, the PGI, these various other measures uh, using actually different methods, sometimes uh, kind of Poisson regression, uh, 
um, depending on the measure. Uh, Mamadou Yauk actually helped a lot with that aspect. Uh, and then costs, we use GEE. Jihoon Lim, who's a PhD student. Mamadou Yauk is a postdoc working with Erica Moody. Uh, Jihoon Lim is a, is a, uh, a PhD student working with, uh, mostly with uh, Dimitra Panagiotoglu in the FE department. Uh, so results to date, basically we didn't see any association directly between fidelity and any of the, of any of the measures, uh, except basic hospitalization, we're still trying to sort that one out. It varies according to the time point. So that's a bit unclear. Something's going on, but it's a bit difficult to characterize. We do see an association of higher fidelity with lower costs. So uh, this is actually the detail of the results with costs. So you can see that uh, the interactions uh, are significant at, for total cost at nine and 13 and a half months and 13 and a half to 18 months compared to the first time period. And with the intervention cost there, at, at the last time point, the intervention seems to be less costly for people who uh, had higher fidelity intervention. So our conclusions are, uh, the results so far only provide support for an association with costs. Uh, a more definite conclusion might have been achieved with a larger sample size. We also did narrative interviews with 35 participants at the different sites. Uh, Catherine Vallée, Catherine Briand, and myself are engaged in, in still in analyzing that. So those results will be uh, forthcoming. So now I'm going to pass on to um, to Marianne, who's going to share with us uh, the results of her uh, thesis. So you can share now, Marianne. Thanks, Eric. Here we go. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. And you just see the slides, right? You don't see the notes? No, we just see the slides. It's perfect. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you for having me, everybody. Um, so as a doctorate student, I looked at the role of the Working Alliance and the Strengths Model of Case Management, particularly um, its role as a mediator between fidelity to the Strengths Model and client outcomes. So like Eric mentioned, we had a measure of the relationship between clients and case managers in this study uh, called the Recovery Promoting Relationship Scale. I'm going to talk about two studies or smaller studies that I conducted. One is a secondary analysis of the larger data set and another is a qualitative follow-up study. So for study one, I examined the Working Alliance as a mediator. And um, before I go into this, the details of this study, I'll just say that the definition of the working alliance that I use is borrowed from the concept of the therapeutic alliance in psychotherapy. So I just use the term working alliance because this is outside of the psychotherapy field, but I use a definition from inside the therapeutic alliance or inside psychotherapy. And this is Borden's definition that the working alliance consists of three components. One is the the bond between a client and case manager. The other is the degree to which they agree on the goals of the intervention or the goals of case management. And the third component is the degree to which they agree on the tasks to achieve those goals. So throughout this, throughout the two studies that I conducted, I was particularly looking at whether the Working Alliance here in this context aligned with this definition of the Working Alliance and psychotherapy. So what I did with the with this larger data set was I added the working alliance into a mediation model um, using ordinary least squares path analysis in process. Um, I ran, I tested a mediation model with four different dependent variables. So two of the variables were quality of life measures. One was a measure of community ability, the MCAS, and one was the HOPE scale. I ran these mediation models at both nine months and 18 months. 
And these were the results that I found. These diagram, in these diagrams, I'm presenting the results at each time point. So this is the nine month time point and I'll speak to the 18 month time point next. But the, this diagram represents four different analyses. I've just combined them into one here. And here you'll see that after eight months of being in the strengths model of case management, I found that closely following the strengths model of case management was associated with stronger working alliances between the clients and case managers. And this working alliance was then associated with um, higher quality of life interview scores or stronger quality of life scores. So there wasn't a, like Eric's um, analysis, there wasn't a direct relationship between fidelity and outcomes when alliance was included in this model, but there was an indirect relationship. So um, there was significance both for the for the individual paths, so from fidelity to working alliance and working alliance to uh, quality of life outcome. And the, it, the whole indirect path was also significant using bootstrap confidence intervals. So at 18 months, we, found, we also found more promising results. After 18 months of being in the strengths model of case management, we found that fidelity, again, was strongly high fidelity was associated with stronger working alliances. And then the stronger working alliance was significantly associated with positive outcomes using both the quality of life measures. So the quality of life interview and the patient generated index. And then we also found this significance in the hope scale. And again, there were no direct relationships between fidelity and outcomes, but the, the influence of fidelity on outcomes we found was indirect through the working relationship. And then to follow up on these findings, I conducted a qualitative study to look more in depth at the working alliance in the strengths model. So what are some key underlying elements that are important to clients of case management when it comes to the working alliance in the strengths model? And to examine Examine this, I conducted 20 semi-structured qualitative interviews with clients from one of the participating organizations in the broader study. These were clients from Ottawa and they were people with severe mental illness who also had histories of homelessness or were currently homeless. And I asked, these are just examples of questions that I asked. One was thinking back over your relationship with your caseworker, how would you describe the relationship? Another question was thinking back over your time with your caseworker, what if anything would you say has changed for you? So I explored how people described the relationship with their worker. I also identified elements of the strengths model in those descriptions and I asked about life change. So how did people experience life change? And I coded the, the qualitative data, the transcripts first with first cycle coding using NVivo and then second cycle coding using a cross case matrix in Excel. And while I, while I was staying true to the data and identifying themes that I saw reflected in the data, I also had the mediation model in mind. So one of the ways that I coded the data was with hypothesis codes, where if people linked these broader study concepts like um, the strengths model or the working alliance or life change to each other, then I would code that. So there were ways that I um, did some directive coding while also, again, staying true to the data and how people were, were describing the alliance and the relationship. I'm going to present the findings just based on some key elements in the relationship and then bringing in the strengths model and then talking about life change. I'll just say first, this is a, a table of the characteristics of people who participated. But at the beginning of each of the interviews, I did use the recovery promoting relationship scale with people, the quantitative scale, and found that the, the um, strengths of the working alliances in this, in this group of 20 people was quite high. So this, the findings reflect the experiences of people who have very strong working alliances. They talked about past workers as well. So I found that that gave a little bit of a different perspective on working alliances that may not have been as strong, but overall the, these are uh, very strong working alliances. 
So when describing the relationship that people had with their caseworker, they described the relationship in very practical terms. So here's a quote he's, that says, he's been really helpful in terms of getting things done that I need to get done. Um, so what was very important to people and how they described the relationship wasn't so much like the mental health work that they did, but more things like access to services, like getting housing, getting ID, going to appointments. And this was important to people. And this is important in a research context because there are questions around whether the therapeutic alliance and its concept fits outside of psychotherapy because the focus of the work is very different. So people were reflecting the focus of the work in case management being different, quite different. But we did find that um, even though the focus of the work was different, the working alliance, the definition, Borden's definition was still also very prevalent in people's descriptions of the relationship that they had with their workers. So the work might look different, but the definition still really fit. So here on this slide, you can also see this theme of fit and compatibility. And that really worked well with the element of the bond in Borden's definition of the therapeutic alliance. So people talked about just whether they felt connected with their worker or not, and a lot of different things that influenced that bond, whether it was strong or not. Sometimes that had to do with where people were at in their mental health, or it had to do with similarities that they had with their worker, like um, uh, age matches, or whether they felt like there was a connection in their cultural backgrounds. Um, but there were a lot of different factors that influenced that bond, and it was clearly identified. And then within descriptions of the working alliance, there was this flexibility theme. So clients valued workers that were flexible. This was expressed in um, their use of time and their identity as a professional versus sort of like a friend in the way that they used paperwork. And this was an interesting theme in light of implementing an evidence-based practice when there is a structure or a fidelity to follow within that structured intervention, case managers seem to have a flexibility and a responsiveness to their clients that clients valued and identified. And when identifying elements of the strengths model in the Working Alliance, you'll recall that Eric identified the model talking about leveraging strengths to pursue clients' goals. And the goal theme in the interviews was very strong. So I'll just talk about the goals on this slide. So um, here's a quote about goals and it's linked to the working alliance. So it's a nice quote. A client says, I think that because I'm achieving those goals, it's a stronger connection. So in all of the interviews, people identified goals as a key element of the working relationship and also a key element um, that I could identify as the strengths model intervention. And they talked about goals naturally and without me asking them in my protocol. I had a place where I probed for goals, but they um, raised goals before I mentioned it. And this was important because goals are a key element of the strengths model. And then also the way that clients talked about goals matched with that definition of the working alliance. So people valued um, the focus uh, uh, the people valued when they understood the goals of the intervention that they were part of. And they also broke down um, the goals descriptions into individual tasks. So again, the focus of the work might have been different, but we could identify different elements of the definition of the working alliance in this study as well. And then finally, when people talked about life change, they described changes in their lives as a result of their relationship with their worker in a lot of different ways. So they talked about improvements in mental health, improvements in overall well-being. They also talked about being housed, um, improved relationships, decreased isolation, connections with services, and that this variability in how people describe their life change was a good reminder that there are a lot of different ways that we can measure outcomes quantitatively as well. Um, especially when an intervention is based on individual goals that are, are important to people, so that are client-centered. The, the life change that people described was very linked to the relationship, not so much to um, strongly following an intervention. That seems, that was, um, I, I think, like 
more abstract or not as articulated in the interviews. So that aligns well with our mediation model where, where people associated life change with their relationship with their worker. So this is a conceptual diagram that I developed just based on the findings from the qualitative study. But I won't spend much time on that right now. And I think Tim's going to touch on the broad conclusions from, the, from all of our study findings. Um, what I do want to do is jump into talking about one more component of this um, of the strength study or the implementation of the strengths model in a Canadian context. So I want to talk about the, an implementation study that was conducted. Um, so alongside the fidelity assessments and the client interviews, um, when the strengths model was implemented in these seven sites, there were there was an implementation component that was conducted where we were examining facilitators and barriers to implementation of the strengths model of case management. Um, Eric mentioned this was identifying these facilitators and barriers was one of the main objectives of the overall study. So Catherine Brienne was the lead on this component and um, I'm just presenting the findings on her behalf. We looked at barriers and facilitators to implementation over the first two years of implementing the model through implementation visits at each of the sites. So researchers visited the sites over the course of a couple of days, 11 times in those two years, and they used two different types of data collection method. One was through eth ethnographic observations of the intervention in practice. So through team meetings or through training sessions or through client case manager meetings. And then also researchers conducted semi-structured qualitative interviews with staff members who were implementing the model. So case managers, program managers, directors, um, clinical supervisors. They were asked things like, what are your initial thoughts on implementation of this model? Tell me a story of what has changed now that your organization and you are implementing this model, just as some examples. When we analyzed the interview data and the observation data thematically, we found that the themes that we identified were closely aligned with Dam Schroeder's consolidated framework for implementation research. So this is a framework that um, identifies nine, dom I mean, sorry, five domains that um, where you can, five domains that explain um, facilitators or barriers to successful implementation of evidence-based practice. So I'll touch on each of these domains and just identify how they fit in the research findings. The first domain is that the characteristics of the intervention itself can lead to successful or more challenging implementation. And we found that staff members perceived the strengths model as a complex intervention, but it was adaptable to different contexts and clients. So when staff members and case managers in particular felt that there was room for flexibility in implementing the model, they were positive about their implementation experience. The second domain is characteristics of people involved in implementing the model. So when it came to characteristics of the case managers, um, we found that, that the change in practice took quite a bit of time and it took time for case managers to pivot their practices and also to change the way they saw their roles and their work. So we could identify that there were changes in perspective around the model and changes in attitude and these matched with state, the stages of change around implementing a model. The third domain is the characteristics of the, of the organization itself. So while the intervention aligned well with the values and overall practice of case managers, pretty much everybody said at the beginning of the study that they believed in the strengths model philosophy. Um, even though the, the philosophy aligned well with them, some organizational cultures and climates were more open to new ways of working than others and some of them um, it just took more time for them to um, implement the model with high fidelity, particularly because of these organizational cultures or implementation readiness. Janet's going to talk about readiness in a couple of minutes too. 
And then the third domain is the process itself of implementing an evidence-based practice. So the implementation process had characteristics that impeded or facilitated implementation. Things that helped were having um, concrete support throughout implementation built into the implementation process, and then the monitoring and evaluation of the model imp implementation was also a facilitator. And then finally, there are elements of the outer setting that also help with implementation. So in this case, there was a real partnership between Rick Gosha, the consultant that helped with implementing this model, and this ended, his partnership ended up being a real facilitator. So um, there was initial training and then ongoing support of model implementation. So that's what I wanted to present on the implementation study, and I'll hand it over now to Janet. Okay, uh, thank you. Lots of information being shared. Uh, the piece I'm going to talk about is a survey that we did uh, at the 36 month uh, part of the study. So we, when we did the final fidelity review with the sites, we added in uh, a staff readiness survey. And we did the readiness survey because we wanted to find out, uh, Marianne just provided a lot of feedback that was based on our uh, on consultant visits. Uh, the staff views about an intervention are critical to uh, a successful implementation, but we do know that views can vary among, among staff and um, views are dynamic, they change over time. So uh, what this survey allowed us to do is get feedback at the individual level from the staff and we did it at 36 months after they'd had uh, a fair bit of time to work on the implementation, but also at a, a vulnerable point in the study because we were at that point going to be withdrawing our supports and we wanted to understand as best we could uh, what the state of the sites was uh, at that point in time. And uh, this data can complement other data that we're receiving. So the, feed, the fidelity data uh, and the data that Marianne shared about the um, qualitative feedback. So what is the tool? It's called the Readiness Monitoring Tool. It was developed by um, a, a group in the US, uh, the Wandersman Group, Abe Wandersman. Uh, and the particular tool in the conceptual frame uh, was developed, was led by Jonathan Scaccia, and there's uh, some papers uh, that one can reference on it. They developed a survey based on a comprehensive review of implementation frameworks and, and notably and very strongly represented in the tool is the CIFR. They um, built three domains to assess staff feedback on. One is the motivation, so the staff beliefs about the innovation that contribute to whether it's used, uh, the staff perception of their innovation specific capacities, uh, and the staff perception of the general organization capacities and the supports for them to implement uh, a new innovation. And each of those high level domains has uh, multiple subdomains within them. So here's some example items. Uh, uh, so one, the strengths model case management represents an advance over other models of support that are currently available in our organization. That's in the motivation and it's a relative advantage item. We have the knowledge and skills to conduct the assessments of client strengths that's under specific capacities. And our organization regularly takes time to consider ways to improve how we do things that's under the general capacities and the extent to which the organization values in it and supports innovation. The tool, the version that we used had 67 items or each item is rated on a seven point scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Uh, a rating of five or below uh, indicates an area for improvement. We did uh, descriptive analyses at the item subdomain and domain level. And we also compared management and direct service staff because the, there's a fairly strong literature saying that they don't always align. And, uh, but it is important that they do align because that will put you up in a better position to successfully implement. We collected the data at the, near the end of the study 
uh, through an email invitation to the survey. Our final sample was uh, 78 staff, uh, 57 involved in direct delivery and 21 management, which was an 80% response rate. And just a few details about that sample. Among the, the direct delivery staff, only 4% had been delivering the model for less than six months. So they were a fairly uh, experienced group in terms of delivering uh, the innovation. Uh, at the same time, among the management, uh, over half were not directly involved in delivery. And that's um, a critical issue because the literature suggests that management may not always share the, um, the frontline staff experience when the frontline staff are actually involved in trying to figure out how to deliver a, a new model. So these are the survey results. Um, this is the uh, overall, so this is the results by domain and subdomain. Um, you can see here that the specific capacity, the mean rating is 5.8. So it's uh, a little bit higher than the other two domains, the motivation domain and the general capacity domain. And if we consider that five is sort of the cutoff for um, looking at, the, at whether there might be uh, some need for more support or discussion among staff about how they're feeling, there are a number of items that uh, sit at the five or below mark that might uh, warrant some more discussion. At the same time, there's a number where there's uh, high ratings, uh, very positive responses. So rather than go over the details here, I just want to move you to this next uh, slide. This slide uh, is comparing the staff and the, um, uh, the, the frontline staff and the uh, management results, the blue line is the front line and the orange is the management. And you can see that across every subdomain, the uh, management ratings are higher than the front line ratings. And um, sort of this, I think this sort of flags a little bit that there may have been to some degree a bit of a disconnect uh, between some of the perceptions. And then when we look more closely at some of the actual responses, uh, in, in the motivation category, the two ratings that were lower were observability and priority. And there is, there, we did get some feedback during the study um, that the model, uh, these, the, the clients of the programs delivering it were long, or many of them were longer term clients. And we did get some feedback that staff uh, found them, that the new way of doing work was a bit harder for some clients to uh, become accustomed to and engage with than others. And this result suggests that they, that they may not have seen some of the benefits for, for all the clients that, that, they, uh, uh, would, that one would hope they would see. Um, in terms of priority, there's some, uh, again, the marginal result might suggest that they didn't feel it necessarily was getting the endorsement by the organization that they might have wanted. When we look at the um, innovation specific skills, uh, the perceptions there are, are fairly good. The, the one lower one is the intra-organizational relations. That uh, pertains to getting, uh, that's the outer setting that uh, Marianne talked about. So getting supports from others in the systems was, is a new innovation. So they probably weren't getting that in this study. That might be something for future work. And then if we move into the uh, general capacities area, you see there are a number of ratings where the mean is below five. And this raised sort of the general issue that um, at an organizational level, there might have been some perceptions of staff that they weren't getting the support that they wanted to do the work. We know there's some, there were some specific results in the fidelity feedback um, that, that might support this. The, uh, there was uh, the the team leads finding the time to do the individual level supervision uh, was difficult in some cases. They were very good at conducting the group supervision team meetings, but they had more trouble doing some of the individual supervision and particularly the shadowing uh, uh, of um, client and staff meetings in the field that was part of the model. Uh, we also found that the tools that Marianne mentioned, there were um, at least the site that I supported had moved to a electronic um, uh, 
you know, all, all electronic forms and tools. And uh, at that point, the uh, strengths management model was still on paper. There might have been some tensions around them integrating there. So there were some practical issues that came up that might uh, be reflected in these ratings. But I think the general message here is that the that there wasn't total alignment here. And I think in terms of, of supporting the site to do well with implementation, it would be really important to check both and, and particularly for the frontline, make sure that they're getting the supports that they need. So just in summary, the uh, ratings were higher uh, for specific capacities, but a bit lower for motivation and general organization support. Uh, some, there were many that exceeded five. Some of the areas that were lower, I, I've just spoken to. Uh, and that this was, was valuable feedback. I think the, the notion of the tool is that it can be and should be repeated something like this on a regular basis because how people experience an intervention uh, implementation in the early stages may not be uh, what they experience later on and getting this uh, ongoing feedback can be very helpful to, um, to continue uh, supporting high quality implementation. Uh, limitations, it is a cross-sectional snapshot sample. The respondents self-identified as either direct service or management and um, the management group uh, had people that might have been uh, doing multiple roles and also might have been higher level in the organization as well as directly involved with the teams. And the, the, the readiness measure itself, as um, since we've used it, has continued to be refined and tested. Uh, and um, so there's new versions of that. Thank you. Thank you. Is it Tim? Yeah, that's good. Let me uh, look at this again. Great. Let me, uh, there we go. Okay, that's great. Um, I, I'm just going to be a few minutes. Um, let me just say, though, that um, it, it's, it's just been wonderful working on this project. Eh? Um, I mean, it's this, is, this idea of multi-site projects is so rich and there's so much learning um, that goes on. And in this case, it was really, it was really kind of action research because you know they, it just kept, the findings were getting fed back around fidelity and um, agencies were, were trying to improve their fidelity. Um, so, uh, and kudos to Eric for putting this together. I mean, I know, I know, Eric, when you put in the CIHR, you, 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 I think you said it was a bit of a shot in the dark, but it got funded the first time around, which was, was quite something. But I, but I think it's an under-researched area, eh? intensive case management. I mean, from my understanding, these are probably the only programs that have put this in place in Canada, um, which uh, shows we have, we have work to do. Um, you know, we're in the process of, of disseminating the findings in, in Ontario. Um, to, you know, as uh, Eric mentioned, two of the three agencies implemented them. Um, um, so we, we certainly want to build on that. Um, that, that that's, that's very important. And we would like to uh, disseminate or diffuse the, um, the approach uh, in Ontario. And it, this comes at a very interesting time. Um, our, gov our provincial government has put out a new, uh, their mental health policy uh, in the fall uh, 2020. Um, and they have core services um, that include case management, of course, um, for people with, uh, I think it's for people with moderate and complex kind of needs. Um, as well as for people with moderate needs. Um, it includes a, a new center for excellence. Um, and, and Janet, who's you know, been such a, a contributor to, to program development and policy uh, in Ontario has, um, has developed a, a community of interest on fidelity. Um, so we're really, we want fidelity of strengths-based case management to, uh, 
to be part of what the Center of Excellence uh, will consider important in, in, in helping uh, disseminate the approach. Um, as was mentioned, we've heard from, um, I know the agency that Marianne and I know well in Ottawa that, um, that really valued uh, being involved in this project, they, they, they're really committed to continuing and they also want to be part of uh, further fidelity assessments. And I think a message, you know, from the findings is that um, it's a challenge uh, to get to fidelity, but it's also a challenge to sustain it. So, so you do need, you know, ongoing uh, training um, and technical support. And that's what we're trying to figure out now as we go forward um, and including, which is really a kind of a, an innovative way of doing fidelity, which is this, these exchanges between uh, agencies um, I, I know it's been done previously, I think, and, and Janet knows more about this than I, than I do with the early episode, uh, the early intervention programs for psychosis have done this in Ontario. So this is, this is a model and it, it also might be nice to see if we can see how many of the agencies uh, of this, uh, that were involved in the project would be willing and interested in, in doing these exchanges. And I, I think given that we've moved to telehealth, telemental health, I think we're gonna have to figure out how to do uh, fidelity assessments as well, uh, which, which would be a lot more economical than, than was required in this project. Although I think it, it speaks to the, the fidelity assessments, I, I think in this project were quite rigorous, so. Um, so that's that's kind of where, where we're at right now. And, and again, it's it's just been a pleasure being involved um, uh, in this project. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Tim. So I'm just going to quickly conclude. So so Tim has talked some about the situation in Ontario. In Quebec, I'll say um, the Centre National d'Excellence en Santé Mentale was quite involved in um, in this project, they participated in the fidelity evaluations. They took on board a lot of the uh, the practices of the strengths model, and it influenced the training that they give to what we call SCV teams here, and even a little bit ACT teams. Uh, there's something here for ACT teams as well. Um, unfortunately, the CNRSM is kind of in a weak position right now. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen there. Uh, there is grassroots interest in further expansion in Quebec. Uh, Rick Rocha presented on this to Housing First teams about two years ago now. Uh, there was a lot of interest. The problem is we need more funding to, to organize more training. And just to, to sort of wrap up kind of a high level overview of our findings. So higher fidelity to the strengths model appears associated with positive client outcomes via the Working Alliance. Our evidence also suggests that higher fidelity is associated with lower costs. And high fidelity implementation, implementation is challenging. Tim also mentioned the, the problem of not just getting there, but maintaining a high level of fidelity, avoiding practice drift. But it's potentially rewarding for staff. Um, and, uh, and also, the model has a clear consistency with the recovery orientation, which makes it attractive to a lot of staff. So I'll just uh, stop here. And um, I should have uh, shown it this way. So, so I'll just stop here. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. We do have a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much uh, for the group presentation. That's very interesting to see, you know, the real application of, you know, the evidence from the literature and that actually applied in different provinces, different settings. I do have a question for, I don't know, to Erica or maybe all of the presenters today. So going through pandemic, I don't know, you know, in what situation or when you actually run the study so whether it's before pandemic or after pandemic or going through the pandemic some period. 
So how would you anticipate the, you know, in the future, how would you apply the same practices into different settings, different institutions? Well, we, we finished data collection well before the pandemic in 2018, actually. Um, so how would we, how would we do it if we had to do it in a pandemic? Is that your question? Yeah, because, you know, through different angles or different lenses, you already, you know, provide a strong or robust evidence to show, you know, the strength model or practice actually works. Then I don't know, as you say, you know, given in time, there may be some drift practice, right? Then how would you guarantee or make sure you still have the same performance after a couple of years? Would you, you know, thinking to have, you know, another study? trying to say how you know, consistency well, or continuity well, of the practice. T Tim alluded to the possibility of setting up a, a community of practice and having ongoing fidelity assessments. I think fidelity assessments are key to keep people on track. In Quebec, the Centre National d'Excellence en Santé Mentale, the CNESM, does fidelity assessments of ACT teams. Uh, and it has done a kind of similar process for SEV teams. So I think that's really what you need. You need uh, kind of um, at least a, sort of a, a community of practice with a commitment to evaluating each other's fidelity and encouraging each other. And I would say preferably on top of that, a provincial level commitment to implementing a practice according to a specific model. Uh, Quebec certainly has done that with ACT and to some extent SCV teams um, with thanks to the CNESM. And it's actually a bit of an issue right now that uh, the current provincial government has been uh, has, has been sort of reducing the role of the CNESM. So we're, that's I, a bit of a I concern. I could add to that too for um... In Ontario, I, as, as was said earlier, I'm quite involved with the early psychosis intervention network and they've uh, done some pivoting to virtual care um, and there's, uh, but there's a lot of communication and uh, sharing of, of methods and tools and they, and I think the pivot has appeared to be successful in a number of ways. Um, I think they do treat a young clientele who are pretty tech savvy and I think that probably helps. It'd be important to find out how it's the, uh, these older cl clients might be experiencing it, but, um, but, but there has been a lot of shared learning. So I think to Eric's point, it's, it's an actually an opportunity to, to start working really well together to learn. In Ottawa too, Tim and I are involved in looking at how the how CMHA Ottawa has implement has pivoted to delivering case management. So the strengths model of case management virtually, and um, we're seeing there's there was this initial change where obviously it, it was set quite a crisis, um, uh, an experience of lots of crises. So maybe the strengths model tools were set aside for a period of time, and as people have adjusted, it seems like they're Continue, continuing in the goals focus are able to broaden things a bit. And then also there's that adjustment in terms of technology. Like Janet mentioned, there are some um, clients, maybe older clients or clients in different circumstances where the technology doesn't work as well or people in shelters as well. So the, in Ottawa, they continue also to deliver the strengths model of case management virtually in the pandemic. Thank you all.